Well, the tall pulpit is back. That can only mean one thing. <laughs> and uh, we're starting a new series this morning on financial fitness. And to kick us off, here's our senior minister, Pastor Bill. Let's welcome him this morning. I love this tall pulpit. You've got to believe what I put up with traveling around the world. I'm like this. <laughs> Particularly in nations where there's short people. But uh, it's great to be home after um, uh, being in the Solomon Islands. Did you uh, enjoy my video last week? Yeah. And Jimmy Vasula saying hi. And um, yeah, Jimmy's a wonderful guy. We actually supported him for uh, 20 years, he and Mary, uh, Solomon Island missionaries to Papua New Guinea. And they came here for 12 months and uh, were part of the team and, and uh, kind of in-service training. And so I said to Jimmy, if when he goes back to the Solomons, I'll come and support him. So he leads the church in Honiara, which is the capital of the Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands is about a thousand islands and they're a long chain of islands, about, must be 1,100 kilometers long. And uh, the main islands are the ones that are populated. But Jimmy uh, is the national chairman of our CRC movement there. We have 15 established churches and 10 outreaches that will become churches and they're full of faith to really go for it and plant as many churches as possible. Thank you for those of you that sponsored uh, my books to go. So nearly killed me carrying 60 of those books and delivering them to the... They, go, they just love them. And I, I taught on, uh, on those three books as well. I took particular sections and uh, they were very appreciative and uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, Guadalcanal Island... Um, some of you may not be aware of it, but it was one of the most intense battle sites of the Second World War. Just check out Wikipedia and it'll give you the details. But uh, um, 118,700 Japanese boys were killed there in the Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands. That's a lot of, a lot of young people, mostly kids, sent by their stupid government to, to, to fight. We had, I think, must have been 10, 12, 15,000 American, Aussie, UK boys that were killed there as well. Um, but uh, the battles of Guadalcanal were just uh, significant. In fact, if, if they were not won, uh, Brisbane and Sydney would have been, they, if they wanted the airfield there, and uh, Brisbane and Sydney would have been bombed continuously and they would have established bases there. The Second World War would have gone on for another five or six years if they grabbed a hold of Australia and Port Moresby. And, and also the whole west coast of America would have been exposed because Guadalcanal, the, the sea, sea lanes would have been open. So, um, so when you're there, you just, uh, I was on a beach and they call it Red Beach. I said, why is it Red Beach? I said, because the sand was red for such a long time. So many people were killed as they landed there. And um, so uh, six months of intense fighting. Four American presidents fought around that area. Uh, President Kennedy nearly got killed as a young person just north of Guadalcanal. Um, so, um, yeah, you're there and you, you realise you're part of history. And um, the interesting little thing, the airport is called Henderson International Airport, not Honiara International Airport on Guadalcanal. And I said, why Henderson? They said, well, Henderson was a young boy that was killed in the Battle of Midway, an American boy. And uh, nobody knows him. And, um, but when the Americans ultimately took over Guadalcanal and uh, kicked out the Japanese, uh, they named it after that boy, that little airfield. And the Honiarans and the Guadalcanal people have just said they just kept the name for 70 years instead of making it Honiara International Airport. So just little things like that. And you realise, man, one life, nobody knew. Nobody knows him. An airport named after him. So you just realise the senselessness of war, the futility of war, the waste of, of lives. Of, uh, but, you know, sometimes evil has to be combated. And uh, so, yeah, so being there was, uh, you know being in a historic place and, and worth your while actually reading the story because it's very significant of what, of what took place there. So uh, also I was, I was fit and well because I had two bouts of jolly um, flu in April and so I'm so thankful that, uh, for your prayers that were great. I felt I was carried along by the Holy Spirit at times because I mean you sweat. If you see some of my photos, my clothes are just drenched. <laughs> so you, you're sweating and you're drinking gallons of water. Um, and so, uh, but I, I took the afternoons off. I did three hours in the morning, two hours at night. I just made sure I paced myself better. And uh, my children were after me this time. They actually were saying, if you're still sick, you're not going. You're going to cancel it. 
most daughters of mine are ferocious. <laughs> and um, so I had to obey them. And so uh, I've come back and I'm fit and well, which is fantastic. It's a, it's a joy to be able to preach. I'll be, I'll be sharing for the next five Sundays. Can you believe it? Five in a row. Then at the end, you'll probably say, can we have somebody else in July, please? And we're doing a series called Financial Fitness. And today, as I mentioned in my letter to you, we'll be launching our, at the end of the service where we're going as far as our facilities development over the next three years. Um, and so, but I, I want to share in the series on, on principles that really, I know my wife and I have, have actually outworked in our lives. It's not theory. And so many people in the church here. And uh, Jesus has a lot to say about how we manage the material things of life. And it reveals a lot about our walk with him. And so I trust that uh, it'll be helpful. Like in, in a couple of weeks' time, and I'll share next week, we've got an expert coming in who's going to share on budgetary planning. He'll be on a Tuesday and Wednesday night, a couple of weeks' time, free seminar, how to actually set a budget, live within your means, reduce debt. We'll have some testimonies next week, the week after, of people who really do it well in the life of the church. Um, great examples of, uh, of folks who have learned how to handle finance, live within their means, re reduce debt, develop an asset base, plan effectively. And so it'll be practical as well, which will be helpful. I trust you'll, you'll pick up a lot of things on this. But uh, today I want to share on uh, the most difficult parable in the whole New Testament. It's one that, that theologians and scholars go, oh, that's really hard. What do you mean, Jesus? And so they ignore it and they don't tackle it. But you know me, I like to tackle the tough subjects. So um, uh, this one is the, and I've shared on this a few times over the years, it's the parable of the dishonest but shrewd manager. Um, and it's found in Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. You can read it. Uh, I'll read a couple of verses in a few moments. But even though... Jesus gets your attention. I mean, he gets your attention and he keeps your attention by giving stories. He's a great storyteller. And he makes stories up. That's what parables are. He just makes stories up. And uh, he either shares on real life things or he makes up a story. And then there's usually, you know, once, you, once he's shaken you up and he's got your attention, what do you really mean, Jesus? There's a take-home point. And here, there, it's about being wise with your finances. But the story's about a boss... This is a landowner, a very wealthy guy, and he's got, a, he's got a steward, a manager. A bit like Joseph in Genesis' story, he was Potiphar's, Mr. Potiphar's steward. He managed his, his estate. So uh, this guy's rich, he's got a, a manager, and, the, and the, the boss thinks something's a little bit fishy here. I don't quite understand how the books are lining up, you know, like, and he hears maybe some rumours back, so he does an investigation into the manager. And the manager goes, uh-oh, somebody spilt the beans. And he realises, man, I'm going to be dead meat or I'm going to get the sack. And so what he does, he goes to all the creditors of, of, of the boss and he says, okay, um, uh, Jill, how much do you owe him? Uh, you owe him $10,000. Um, just just $5,000 will be fine. Uh, Joan, how much do you owe him? $1,000? Uh, $500 will be fine. And so Joan and... Jill think, fantastic, what a wonderful human being he is. He's letting us off. Not knowing that that guy was screwing them anyway. And, and he's probably charging extra interest, which was illegal for, in Jewish culture. You're not you're allowed to loan money, but you can't charge interest. So he's a crook. He's crooked. <laughs> and uh, and so, so he lets everyone off 50%. And... Jesus commends him. This is the part that drives people crazy. He commends him. This guy's smart. And it's almost like people that are superficial reading go, oh, Jesus is commending dishonesty. He's commending being a crook. No, he's not actually. He's actually commending the guy for being really shrewd because he's thinking about his future. And he thinks, man, I'm going to get the sack. So if I let Michael off 50% and, and I let uh, uh, Kathy off 50%, when I'm broke and when I'm, I'm out of a job, they will look after me. That's how, oh, you know, he, Bill looked after. And, and so he's actually planning and preparing for his future. And Jesus uses this story to reverse the, to say, now there's some lessons about this guy who's a crook 
we are not crooks, what about how are we preparing for our future and what kind of future? So he's not commending dishonesty and cheating. Uh, he's commending the fact that the steward was shrewd because he planned for his future by discounting the debts owed to his master in order to obligate the debtors to himself. So this guy is selfish, selfish, <laughs> totally thinking of himself, and Jesus says, okay, can I take the lesson here of this parable of how we can be selfless when we consider the kingdom of God and the interests of, uh, of other people? And so there, I think there are four, I see four stewardship truths that are applicable to us. And I just want to lay this as a foundation for the other talks that I'm going to give and, and uh, which might be a little bit more practical before I share with you our, our stewardship focus regarding our facilities development. The first thing is, prepare for eternity with Jesus. <laughs> Plan your eternal future. This is what he's saying. In Luke 16, 8, he says, the master commended the dishonest manager. Not because he's commending dishonesty, but because he acted shrewdly. And this is the line that Jesus says, for the people of this world, your non-Christian neighbours are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. So he says, look around you and see how people are handling their finances, their material, and actually they're smarter than you for particular reasons. Many non-Christians are far more committed for their future here on earth than we as Christians are in preparing for our future in heaven. They prepare for the maximum of life here and now, but they're going to die. He says, you've got to look after the material affairs of life now, but death is a doorway for heaven. How are you preparing for your future with me? So there's nothing wrong with preparing for life here and now. For example, when, when I had four little children uh, under five years of age and um, were on one salary, we decided to take out death cover on me because what would happen if, if suddenly... I died, kathy has got four kids, so, so the, the insurance cover covered all our indebtedness regarding our mortgage, plus it gave Cathy a, a little bit of extra money until the kids went to school, then she had to go and work. She wasn't going to get off scot-free. <laughs> so, uh, so you do that, and then when you get older, and my kids have grown up, you don't need the death cover. What do you do? You increase your super. Isn't that right, those who are 55 plus, you've increased your super? I'll talk about this next week. You need to. You've got to be wise. Get a financial planner. Forget the death cover stuff. Increase your super. Plan for the future. Because you're going to live to 95. Some of you will live to 105. So you've got to plan for that. How are you going to live? How are you going to function? So there's nothing wrong with that. It's responsible and important, particularly for those who are dependent on you. And so sickness cover, you know, salary cover, if, some, if you got sick. So all these insurance schemes are good. There's nothing wrong with them. And so if people do that for preparing for the maximum of life here on earth, what about eternity? We should live in the present world with eternity in mind. And for those of us that are in their mid-60s, we know we have less years ahead of us than what's been preceding us. <laughs> so we know we're a little bit closer than some of you guys in your 20s and 30s and go, oh, that's a long way. I'm not going to worry about that. You better start thinking because it goes, the time goes really quick. And so we're going to blow towards this to say, how can you be responsible? How can you prepare? How can you maximise the use of the material things God has given to you to bless his kingdom and to ensure that you look after yourself and your, and your kids and your grandkids and, and, and the Lord's work? So whatever we do in this life has repercussions for eternity. Now, let me qualify this because some people might interpret it going, oh, well, therefore my salvation is dependent on this. No. Your salvation is dependent on the free grace of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, we are saved by his great sacrificial giving act on a cross. Nothing we can do can earn salvation. It's our response to that act of grace, that act of generosity, that act of salvation that restores us back to God. Our sins are removed and we have peace with our Father 
We have power to live now and we have a future, the gift of eternal life and the gift of the Spirit to empower us. It's gratitude, it's worship. And as part of our worship response, giving and generosity and wise stewardship flows out of this as part of our, our worship response to him. And so we're all going to meet the Lord face to face one day and I'm so glad when I face Jesus I'm not going to be judged for my past sins. In fact, even if I bring them up before him, he'll go, what are you talking about? Well, what was that? I don't remember that. No, 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 I don't see your past sins. My blood covered your past sins. You're saved forever. And uh, you're safe. And uh, so we're not going to be judged for our past sins. That's been cancelled out. However, what we do with this investment of grace that God has freely bestowed on us will come under the searching light of God's scrutiny. And so we all have to give an account of our lives to God. We do. And there's another parable. I'm not going to go into it now. But the parable of the talents, you read it in Matthew 25, that fits in with the parable of the, of the shrewd manager. Again, Jesus talks about money and, and financial things. Do you know he talks more about money, your attachment to it, material things, he talks about heaven and hell? You check it out. You check out your concord talks more because he knows we live in this physical, material, sensuous world and, and our senses have respond to it. And it's so easy for what's been created to block out the creator who we can't see with our natural eyes and that's why the lord really handles this subject very very strongly in parables and in other passages so the parable of the talents when you read this he basically says hey everyone's given different different gifts you might have 10 talents five talents two talent one talent and when judgment day comes when we're assessed judge on what we've done with his grace he's not going to say well you're going to get a better reward because you've had 10. You're more, you've got more abilities, I've given you 10, and you have less ability, so I'm only giving you two talents. He's not going to judge us on, on, on our abilities. He's going to judge us on how available we've been to him and what we've done with what he's given to us. So he says, well done, faithful servant. You've had two, or you've had five, ten. You've invested it wisely. You've used it wisely. Enter into your, into your master's happiness. Uh, but the person who said, oh, man, I just took you for granted, Jesus, and the gifts you gave to me, I, I just buried them. I didn't worry about it. You know, I'm, I'm not important. And, and he says, you slothful guy. What's the matter with you? I gave you a gift. You didn't use it to help other people, to make an investment, to, in, to add value to what I've given to you. He goes, this is not your salvation at risk, but, man... Your reward's going to be a little bit less. And he tells the guy off in, in the parable of the talents. It's, it's pretty strong. And so he's saying being faithful, being honest, being reliable, being responsible is the measure of God. Not how many abilities you have. To whom much is given, much is required. And so the parable of the talents is, is a really strong one that fits in with the parable of the shrewd manager. So he's actually saying to us, prepare for eternity with me. Life is more than just living in this world. How you live here is going to affect eternity and the rewards that you will receive and the commendation that you will receive, not to do with your salvation. Secondly, Jesus is up front. He goes, you've got to use money to win people to, to, to me. He says, provide for, for my cause, provide for the cause of Christ. And he says, come on, you've got to get perspective. And he said this in Luke 6, 9. I tell you, this is the story of the street manager, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Isn't that an interesting scripture? Who are the friends? The friends are the people that you win to Christ. When it's gone, what's gone? Well, either when you're gone and you're in heaven or when the money's gone. So the money's gone when you're gone. So it's both. So when it's gone, when you no longer need it, no longer use it. He goes, how many people are going to welcome you into eternal dwellings? So, you know, like, Helen, you get to heaven and all of a sudden you get to heaven and all these people come and say, Helen, thank you, thank you, thank you. Roz, thank you. Oh, you know, thank you. And, and you say, for what? Thank you. That I'm saved. And you go, but I didn't know you. They might be a Japanese person. 
That might be a Melanesian person. She said, I didn't know you. But the money that you give to missions, the tithes you put into your local church for ministry purposes, for mission, facilities to help the functions of the church, somehow God transmutes that into souls into the kingdom. I don't know how many people I've influenced. Like I, I go to some of these places and one of the pastors said, oh, Pastor Bill, I was in, in Bible college class in 1992. I still remember what you taught. I said, you still got my notes? Yep. So I didn't even know. He was a student back in 1992 in, 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 in Port Moresby. So he's one of the pastors. So I'm influencing him by an act of generosity, going there. I don't do it for money. And you send me. I'm sowing into him 30 years ago. He goes, goes back to his island, plants churches, people get saved. So some of those people are going to be your welcoming committee because it's by your faithful support. Supporting Jimmy for 20 years. You might say, oh, I've just given money to the mission. No, you're giving it to see souls saved into the kingdom. And they're going to be your welcoming committee. And Jesus recognises this. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends. Folks, through your giving, see it, that you're gaining friends for eternity. Wow. Powerful. You're not, you may not be an evangelist that personally leads them to Christ. But you're called to be a witness. You're called to emulate our giving saviour as part of our worship. So our money, worldly wealth, is transmuted into souls for God's kingdom. So as we take up our weekly tithes, as we give our monthly missions offerings, um, our facilities development, these are vehicles for ministry and mission. And um, look what Proverbs 11.30 says. I haven't got these up there, these scriptures. But let me read these. Proverbs 11.30 says, He who wins souls is wise. Do you want to be wise? Win souls. You say, but I'm not an evangelist. You can win souls through your giving. Jude 1.23 says, snatch others from, from the fire and save them. As Reinhard Bonnke says, we're out to plunder hell and populate heaven. 1 Corinthians 9.27, I have become all things to all men, Paul said, so that by all possible means I might save some. Wow. I'm in the hotel in Honiara and I tell you it was an experience. I've got some stories to tell about the cooks. I won't tell them now. I nearly lost my sanctification. I nearly went down to the kitchen and said, what's happening here? Is this a mistranslation? I pass on this instruction. And what comes back is the opposite. And anyway, so, um, so I'm having some fun with the girls. And the final day, I said, OK, I'm here. I said, can we get the breakfast right this morning? Do I have to go down? And they're looking at me. I said, Do I? I said I'm going to give you clear instructions. Can I write it down? And you know what? He still got it wrong. <laughs> he sent me five eggs. <laughs> when I ordered two. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's so funny. But in, even in frustrating situations, I was able to share with those girls, oh, you're a pastor. I said, yeah, sorry I'm behaving badly about my eggs. But uh, yeah, I'm a pastor. I'm just, I was able to witness and share with them and talk with them. And, um, and so you, you, you're there... They're serving you, and you can just then say, oh, well, this is all about me. But it's not, actually. It's all about them. Whatever I'm doing, wherever I am, you've got to share. So those boys that are the security people, I would joke with them, you know, oh, you've got big muscles, good, strong guy. What would you do if somebody came here? He show me his club. I said, good, I feel safe. I said, good on you guys. So I was able to come in. They would, they would you know, as I come in, they treated me like a king. And when they find out I'm a pastor, leader, it's like, I'm tr what am I doing? I'm trying to be authentic and real and to impact their lives so somebody doesn't take them for granted. The grunts, you know, those guys. So they've got families, they're on almost nothing and they're working like 12, hour, 12 hours a day, six days a week. You figure that one out. That's a lot of time. So you've got to be a witness. You become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. So... That's the first thing I see here. The second thing is prioritise, well actually the, the, the third thing is prioritise being trustworthy to Christ. He's really big on faithfulness and, and trustworthiness. In this parable he's really saying prepare for eternity with me. And uh, he goes, you know, provide for my cause. And thirdly, just 
Try and be trustworthy with what I've given to you. Be faithful with all that I have given to you. I've blessed you so much. Look at Luke 16, verse 10 to 12. This is the, the, the verse. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Hey, whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. I mean, the Lord's pretty straight here. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? He goes, this is a test. How you handle money, how you handle material things? Because how trustworthy are you? Is it yours or is it on loan to you? Who owns it really? Scripture says he owns it all. We're just, it's just on loan to us for a short period of time. And if you've not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you the property of your own? We are to be faithful with all God has given to us. Why? Because he owns everything. Those scriptures there that you can see, I've, I've listed them up there. The next slide, guys. God owns all things. Amazing scriptures. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Every animal of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. In Haggai, he says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Acts 17, God made the world and everything in it. It all belongs to him. It's just on loan to you for a few years. And you've got to leave it in better shape than when you first got it. To bless your kids, to bless your grandkids, to bless your church, to bless the world. We are faithful with all that God has given to us because God gives people the ability to produce wealth. Don't think it's your strength. He says in Deuteronomy 8, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Proverbs 10.22 says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. Ecclesiastes 5.19, God gives man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy it. Acts 17.25, he himself gives all men life and health and everything else. Wow. I can prove it to you. The strength that you get is from God's Son. The light that comes from the Son is what gives you the ability to produce wealth. You say, hey, how do you do that? Well, the light hits the green plants... It's a process called photosynthesis. The chlorophyll goes, chung, chung, starch, sugar's produced, and you eat that stuff. Or the animals eat it, and you eat the animals. And that's what gives you strength. So, so who gives you the ability to produce wealth? It's God. It's his sun. It's his light. It's his air. It's his water. We are to be faithful with all that God has given to us because he entrusts us as his stewards. You see, we're often challenged, and probably every Sunday we get challenged through our services, uh, to trust God. And even today when we sang songs in that beautiful script, scripture, when we go through suffering, and uh, sometimes we go through some terrible suffering, life, life hands some curve balls to people, and, and it can be really tough. And that's where we need to, to say, well, God, you are so good, I'm going to trust you even when I don't understand what's going on. So we're, we're encouraged to trust God, but seldom we realize how much God entrusts to us. His world and its resources. You read Genesis 1 to 3. I grieve over the destructive tendencies that human beings do to our environment and to the animal kingdom. Plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. It's just It's just unbelievable. If you do a little bit of research, the number of forests that are being destroyed, it's just horrendous, ruining our earth. The number of animals that are being killed, like South Africa, and I think it's Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Namibia, have now allowed Western hunters to pay big bucks to shoot elephants and lions. Oh, it's just kind of to, to you know, they're getting a little bit... Elephants are a bit of a pest at times with the farmers and there's too many of them. Give me a break. It's all about money. And those officials probably get pocket the money themselves. And you see photos of these lunatics who've got a dead leopard like this. It's a beautiful animal, beautiful animals. And they've just shot it dead. To me, it's a terrible sin. It's not farming for sheep or goats or, or, or cattle for, for human consumption where you're not destroying it. It's just it's terrible. All the oceans are filled with plastic. We send our plastic to Malaysia for them to process it. We can't even process our own. 
and the dolphins and the whales eat it. They reckon it's just, it's mad. Look, I've been thoroughly green on the inside, but I'm not a greenie. Okay, I'm not a greenie politically, but I, I'm an environmentalist. I believe that God has entrusted to us this earth and we've got to look after it. It's a godly responsibility. I mean, you know, the white fellas came here, Europeans, and they think, oh, the black fellas are just ignorant. They know nothing. They don't? Yeah? You go to Kakadu National Park and here, when I went up there, and um, the CSIRO recently, last 15 years, figured out that the Aboriginal people's burning techniques were highly sophisticated and scientifically have been proven to be the way to manage land. But the white fellas come along and say, hey, black man is dumb, he doesn't know, we're just going to let this thing grow. And, and the Aboriginal people, when winter would start, they would actually burn bits of the undergrowth. And the little lizards and, and the snakes had time to get up and get out of the place, or the marsupials, okay? White fella comes, we're not burning any of that stuff, you know, we're doing crops. And then what happened? A bushfire comes, destroys everything, the trees, everything, and all the animals. Stupid, dumb. Who's the smarter ones? The white fellas or the black fellas? I know who's the smarter one. Burke and Wills, really smart explorers. Gonna go to Darwin and back. They come back and land at Cooper's Creek. The depot's gone. There's a bunch of Aboriginal people. They scare them. Oh, you know, get away. And, uh, and one guy goes, hmm, these guys live out here. If I join them, I'll eat what they eat. They live. So he went and joined them. The others stayed there. These guys, where do you go? We got all the fish that we need in Cooper's Creek. They ate all the fish they could eat and they died. They all died because they died of scurvy. The Aboriginal people, did they have the scientific method to figure out vitamins and minerals? No, but they knew how to have a balanced diet. And that white fella lived. Who's the smart one? The white fellas or the black fellas? See, they knew how to handle the land. They knew how to manage the land. We come, tear down the forest, all the soil goes, and we've created an arid area. So, I believe we should voice our opinion on those matters and to be really upfront and say, you know what, we've got to look after our environment. This is God's earth. He made it and he said, I trust you to look after it. And human beings have been absolutely reckless. And even Christians don't kind of get it. So we are stewards of his world and his resources. We are stewards of God's message of love and salvation. We are stewards of God's gracious gifts. We are stewards of God's habitation. He's chosen to live in your body. And if we don't look after our bodies, we're going to limit what God wants to do in and through us. So you violate health principles, eating principles, exercise principles. You violate basic health routine and you're going to reap a harvest of ill health. Same with financially. Next week I'll outline about six or seven key financial principles. You violate those, you're just going to end up broke all the time or in debt. So we're stewards of where God lives. Stewardship involves dedicating every aspect of our being and lifestyle to God. For the totality of our being now belongs to him. We've been bought with a price. Jesus. So what wealth has God given to you? I'll tell you what he's given. He's given to your family. He's given to your family. Husbands, wives, kids, grandkids, sisters, brothers. And uh, to, I mean, I, I can't function without talking to my kids at least once a week. I'll ring them, talk with them. At least once a week. My grandkids, at least once a week. They harass me every day. I, I could be overseas and boom, FaceTime. Hey, Papu, how you doing? I'm just letting you know I'm doing this. I might be in the middle of a meeting and she wants to FaceTime me and tell me what's happening. But I'd sooner have that. I've, got to be, I've brought them into the world. I'm their daddy. I'm their grandfather. You can't just obviate yourself and say, well, well, they're on their own now. They're 18 plus. No, no, no. You never stop parenting. We, we, we are to... That's the wealth that God has given to us. And then our church family. Oh, what a family. 41 years in, in one church with, with thousands of people that have come through and, and the privilege of, of, of just being a faithful steward of, of the many friendships and people that God has brought in, into our lives. Our Bibles, we're, we're to steward our Bible reading and application of Scripture. Our time, how we use our time. Our work and employment. 
to do the very best that we can do and, uh, and to excel in it. So when I was a teacher for three years and, uh, and I'm pastoring the church, 1979, whatever it was, and, uh, and the, well, the church was growing and, and, and my teaching work was getting less and less as far as what I was putting in. And I really, the Lord spoke to me. And I had this terrible nightmare. I think it was a godly nightmare. At the end of the year came, and the principal goes, good riddance to Vasilakis, all our kids failed. He's just focusing on Jesus and church. I thought, oh, wow. I made a decision that I would do less church work and more work making sure those kids passed. And so when, when we finished that year, all my kids that I taught history and biology in year 12 all passed. And at the end, the principal goes, Bill, can you give us another year? You're our best teacher. And I said, I'd love to. I said, but I can't. And you imagine if they, if they, if I, if they all failed. And I said, yeah, Vasilakos, yeah, that Jesus thing, that, you know, oh, yeah. He wants our money, but he's not working. Wow. I thought, how could I do that? What would he think of Jesus? So whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. He's entrusted you. This is wealth that he's given to you, your vocation. Do it well, your employment. Your neighbours, look after them without being intrusive. Little things and big things. When they're sick, provide some food. Just if they're elderly, look after them. And one of our guys is in his 80s and been there forever. And uh, one day the jolly garage door was up. I noticed it up for about an hour or so. So I just went over there and knocked on the door. I said, hey, anyone home? He goes, yeah, it's me, Bill. I said, well, your garage door's open. I said, I've noticed it. And he goes, oh, oh okay, I forgot to do it. I said, I just didn't know whether you're okay. And he just looked at me and says, thank you for, for caring. Just to take an interest. Just, you know, you have neighbours. Look after them. Protect them. When the guys were building their new house next door, there were crooks that were coming in and stealing stuff. Well, I was the local policeman. I had my baseball bat. You come and knock off my friend's house and you're in trouble. No, I'm teasing you. But seriously, you've got, you've got to be involved in, in, in what God has given to you. And uh, your neighbours... Your political and civic duties, to get engaged. Some people, some Chris go, I don't want to get involved in politics, politics is a dirty business. Get involved. Think, reflect, pray, make sure your vote counts. Doesn't mean to say you've got to become political in things, but you, you just got to get engaged. These, these are important things. What a person does with the small things of life, he also does with the big things. Our faithfulness or our dishonesty appears throughout our lives. Our life is a unity. There's no sacred secular division. Everything is spiritual. Faithfulness is not determined by the amount entrusted, but by the character of the person who uses it. The person who uses their money in the wrong thing shows they are unfit to handle more important things. Seriously. People that win the lottery, if they haven't learned how to manage money, they can win millions of dollars. It all goes within a short period of time. They've never learned how to manage it. You hear those stories. They're true stories. Fourthly, finally, oh, I better get moving because I want to release the, um, our facilities direction for the next three years. Place Christ above all else. That's what he's saying. Love God supremely. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. He goes, either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't love the creation above the creator. That's idolatry. Money, for example, is neutral. Money's not evil, it's just neutral. It's neither good nor evil. We, however, cannot be neutral about it. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. Seriously. Nothing wrong with having wealth. Jesus had many wealthy friends. That's why I was really annoyed with the last election that they're attacking people who, who create wealth. And I'm thinking, well... The reality is this, you can check in the South statistically, 3% of the Australian community who work pay 33% of all the taxpayers, that's what the Treasury collects. 20% of people who earn cover 60% of all the money that goes for hospitals, roads, defence, police, etc. 50%, around 50% pay no tax. And people who are dependent. Is that bad? No. Because the way the system is in our, our liberal democratic system, it's very Christian. 
We're saying to whom much has been given. So the people who started these laws in the 1800s were Christian people. So God has blessed you with so much, you pay more tax. But don't despise the wealthy. That's a, that's a terrible thing to bring division. It's a different matter of multinational companies that, that make zillions and then they come out with a system where they pay no tax. That's a different matter. And I think governments need to go after them. But... Uh, Jesus had wealthy friends. We, he would not have been able to function in his ministry if it wasn't for three millionaire women. Their names are Mary, Susanna, and Joanna. Luke 8, 1 to 3. And one of them was married to King Herod's steward. Hey, under evil King Herod's nose, one of his household, his prime minister's wife, got saved. I don't know where she got the money from. I hope she didn't steal it. But anyway... Three years, who's going to pay for the food, the clothing, the lodging for a group of 25, 30 men, women and children that are travelling? It wasn't just Jesus on his own. It was rich women who bankrolled Jesus' ministry. And there have been wealthy people in this church that have bankrolled the church for years and I'm thankful to God for that. So we'd never despise those who are wealthy or who've been given means. And some of you who who are wealthy, then uh, in what we're asking you in your giving, you will give more than those who are not wealthy. Does that mean... Those who are not wealthy, who can only give a small amount, are not as worthy? Of course not. I know people who are on pension who give liberally, and in proportion to their income, they give more than the really wealthy people. Faithfulness. It's not the amount. So, so it is really important to understand this. It's the issue of lordship. You can't serve two masters. You serve God, you use money. And to love Jesus supremely involves giving up our attachment to material things and we're attached to him. You you can't be a slave to two masters. I'm a slave to Jesus. And uh, look at what Paul says. I love Paul's words, the final scripture. Command those who are rich in this present world. Hey, that's you. Every one of you here are rich. It's relative. Even those of you on the pension are rich compared to Solomon Island men who work 12-hour days, seven days a week. The amount of money they're on. And we travel the world in these countries that are dirt poor, and you've got to believe there's no... In Solomon Island, hear this, Solomon Island does not have one dialysis machine. You get kidney disease, sugar diabetes, you just die after a period of time. Not one machine. I've talked to the Prime Minister when he was the Health Minister last time I went. I said, I, said, I can't believe this. And they, all this... And they just... They're robbers. They will rob... And for themselves, and they won't even set up a dialysis machine with, say, 10 machines of pure water to save people's lives. Carelessness, greed. Here, you go to Alice Springs. Our precious indigenous people, who for some reason have got a gene that predisposes them to diabetes and kidney disease, you've got to believe how many machines we have there. We pay for that, and I'm thankful our taxpayers' money goes, so at least these people can live and be on dialysis and function. Our church ministers to them. We've got dozens, maybe a hundred machines there that are working. Not one machine in one country. We are fabulously wealthy. And we need to be so grateful to God for that, not take it for granted, in comparison to these countries. You go into Haiti. As we're driving there, there's a woman at the corner, stark naked, in her, probably in her 50s, running around gesticulating and doing all kinds of stuff, and a whole pile of people just laughing at her. And I, I just couldn't even look. I said, well, what's happening? Because, oh, she's mentally ill. She's been there for a long time. If that happened here, the police would come immediately with a blanket and cover her and take her to the hospital and get some kind of treatment. No mental health services. We take that for granted. Some of these countries, the suicide rate, mental illness is huge. We have a fabulous country. We're wealthy compared to these other places and you only have to travel some of you don't travel I'm telling you the stories because they're true that we need to say God this is a fabulously wealthy country and Paul says command those who are rich in this present world don't be arrogant though nor put your hope in wealth which is so uncertain but put your hope in God who richly provides us get this with everything for our enjoyment there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God's given to you there's nothing wrong with going to Sheffield and watching a snooker match I didn't plan it. My wife did it. 40 years of marriage, 65 years old, she gives me this gift. It costs a few thousand bucks. 
I could have said I could have given it to missions. There's nothing wrong with you taking a trip and going overseas and enjoying what God has given to you. But it must come, my conscience was clear, so was Kathy's. We did it, like if I did it every week, that's a different problem. You see, there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has given to you. You know, we, we, we have to be realistic. Paul says this, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, command them now, and this is what he would say to you, he would command you, he says for me, Bill, command them to do good. Christian Family Centre members, friends, please do good. Be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. In this way, get this, back to, to the parable, what Jesus is saying, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Before we pray, what's he saying through this parable? Live today with eternity in mind. You've got to give an account to Jesus one day, not for your salvation, but for what you've done with what he's given to you. Secondly, use money to win people to Jesus. It's your number one responsibility in life. And thirdly, test Jesus' lordship by letting him guide you in your financial affairs. And we'll give you some practical helps next week. We'll have some testimonies of people. And there's the, some of you need to do that budget night to learn how to prepare a budget and to learn to live within your means. Come up with a strategy of how to reduce debt. And uh, this is a concrete way of testing whether God's the owner of all things. And forsake all other loves for Jesus. Flee all forms of idolatry. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's just so straight. Thank you, Jesus. You don't mix words. You don't deceive. You tell us the truth, but you say it in the most loving, embracing way. And so, Lord, as we've heard this amazing parable, we want to respond to it, Lord. For, for, for some of us here who just need to say, you know what, I need to commence tithing weekly. I just need to do it. Or I need to give to missions, monthly at least. I need to do something. Or I need to be considering my neighbours. How can I help them? I need to be a better steward with my family. I take my kids and grandkids and brothers and sisters for granted. How can I add value to their lives? My neighbours. Help us to see this as a unity, a totality. And Lord, for our stewardship regarding the property you've given to us, amazing property, with things that go wrong, being so old now, help us, Lord, to be responsible for this physical location that so many tens and tens of thousands of people used, Christian and non-Christian. Bless us, Lord. Help us to align ourselves to your plans and your pattern. In Jesus' name, amen. The ushers are going to bring to you right now. We're going to stay in your seat, so I want you to take this booklet, and I want to just go over it with you, because on Sunday the 23rd, of June, which is three Sundays time, is where we have, for those of you who are new to the church, once a year we have this significant offering, the kids and youth, we put big, big containers out here and we make a commitment for three years in relation to where we're heading with our facilities development here in this place. So in this envelope you'll find the booklet, a commitment card and an envelope. We don't want you to give it in today, unless you're already prepared. Um, but to say, okay, I want to think and pray and reflect. What can I do? Let me explain to you what we're on about. Before we read it, three years ago, four years ago, we wanted to do the things that we're talking about. We couldn't do it because our air conditioning went kaput. And uh, we had to actually get the new air conditioning system. People were fainting upstairs. We wouldn't be able to, it was just terrible. And it was a work health safety issue as well. It was actually dangerous, the equipment that was up top there. We got it from the state bank. We put it up there in the late 1980s and somehow it survived, but it died. And so we had to reprioritize what we wanted to do in the auditorium here uh, to get that done. That's been completed, though we still have some debt on that that we have not, that's accrued onto our line of credit. But the areas that we have been wanting to do for a long time is one, our lighting system collapsed. This is all extra that's been put in. That's why it's so dark in here and I can't see you properly. And sometimes when people walk down the aisles, I think, oh Lord, have mercy. May no one fall over and break a bone because, you know, like the work health sector, our lighting, 
went kaput. 1970s technology put up in 1985-86. We haven't touched it. Our audio speakers, which have given us no end of trouble, and some of you have troubled us with your complaints, and I partially agree, because sometimes it's loud there, can't hear it there. Upstairs, it's hopeless. It's old technology. It was, again, 1990s technology, even earlier, and we put it up 20 years ago, and we haven't been able to replace it. But we've come to a place we have to. Also, we need to have a significant large screen here that we've wanted for years to be able to handle all the dramatic presentations we do, Easter, Christmas, all the special... Uh, community groups that come into this place, some of them can't use it because we don't have adequate facilities. And so we want to do that to lift the quality of what we do. And, um, and so we have felt the next three years, now that we've done our chairs, carpets, all this is the first time we've replaced them in 33 years, a few years ago. And that's why I'm, I'm, a, I'm a coffee Nazi. I won't let anyone come in here with a cup of coffee. And some of my pastors are the worst culprits. <laughs> I won't mention and look at anyone. You know why? Because it's like my home. We don't, if to replace that, you're talking about 50, 60,000. To replace the chairs, $200,000. So we've got to be good stewards of that. Last year, we had a major problem, engineering problem with the chairs. People, they started collapsing on us. So what we, when we found out what was wrong, it was a structural defect, to replace them, we're talking about 200,000 bucks. I said, there's got to be a better way. So Milan Tompich found an engineering company that fixed them up for another $10,000. That went on the line of credit. The, the, the jolly projectors busted. That went on the line of credit. We didn't have any plans for that. So having a big facility actually is costly. And so thankfully, we look after the carpets, the chairs, regarding eating, drinking, protection, but we haven't been able to do stuff here that we needed to do. And so if you look at the front page, let me read this to you. The Christian Family Centre is a church for all people who are committed to experiencing the presence and power of Jesus throughout our weekend services and other spiritual gatherings. It is also our privilege to serve our city by allowing many community groups and schools to use our facilities. Over 30,000 people use this place. It's packed out. We let community groups, cultural groups, uh, if people want to bring alcohol in here and have wild parties, we say no. Um, but for several years we've been praying and planning about transforming our auditorium in a way that will better serve our church and draw more schools and cultural groups to see our facilities. Believe it or not, we act, there is an income base. $70,000 per year of our budget comes in through hires. And Milan and the team think that could probably go up to over $100,000 with these changes. Now, we let some people in for free. Uh, the schools have a cheaper rate. And then, of course, some cultural groups we charge higher. But if they went to the Adelaide Town Hall or the Entertainment Centre, they couldn't afford it. This is a fantastic facility. So we do it to engage with our community. We don't do it just to raise finance. Raising finance is a secondary measure, but it is helpful to cover our utilities and other things like that. So... Um, so over the next three years, we are looking to raise $340,000. The air conditioning was $440,000, $450,000. And, uh, and the other thing, just to be aware of, several, a, a couple of months ago I mentioned that we have a line of credit that's just been accruing. Um, and so we want to reduce that down. And we have a strategy over five years we'll, we'll actually remove that line of credit, which is around half a million dollars, just a bit less, and to deal with that, even though equity-wise we're worth 25, 26 million, our line of credit. So we've got a strategy to remove that. Part of it is whatever we raise over the next three years, 48,000 of that will go into reducing credit. And we're not going to put up lights and stuff until the cash comes in so it doesn't go into the line of credit. We've made that commitment to you several uh, uh, weeks ago when I did the financial report as part of our annual general meeting. And so you'll see here the video display screen little statement, the audio system, the stage structure upgrade, because this has to be re-looked at because of engineering to hold the equipment, the, the, uh, uh, the speakers. We have to look at the engineering. We have to put another truss up there so we don't want the roof falling down. Guys, at the end, the summary. This is what we're aiming for. We're trusting God 
that we can raise 484,500 over the next three years. You might think, man, that's a lot. It is. But if you break it down, it's like, how do you eat an elephant? One mouthful at a time. So you break it down to what we can actually afford and what each of us can do. And so for those of us that are wealthier, if you look at the first few categories, we can actually afford that. For those that are not our children, I'm, I'm expecting my grandkids that they'll come in for, you know, $2 a week or, or $4 a week. But have a look at that. If 30 people, 35 people put $2 a week, look down the bottom, that's $10,500. My wife said, Bill, if we had one less cappuccino a day, that's $4, that's seven fours, that's 28, seven fours, that's $28 a week. Just one less cappuccino. You can have the other one. That's 28 bucks a week. That may be a sacrifice for some of you, and you might lose a little bit of this too, as my wife says. Cut out your cappuccinos if we can give more. Oh, sweetheart, but I like my cappuccinos. Seriously. You might say, oh, but my, my amount doesn't count. If all of you get involved in this, and it, the 205 could be 305. You pray, you reflect on what God can give you. My wife and I, she works a fabulous job. She's a university lecturer. I work. We can give significant amounts because we can do that. In five or six years' time, when she's not working, earning an income, and, and I'm not work, say if I'm no longer leading the church here, we'll be able to reduce down. But I'm not asking you to give what we're not giving. Kath and I are putting in $20,000 over the next three years. We've made that commitment. We're going to put five grand in as a deposit on the 23rd and then 100 bucks a week over the next three years. That's our commitment. I would never ask you to give and to say, well, you give and we'll receive. No, no, no. We lead the way in giving and it's a joy. And I only do that and say that not as a point of pride. It's just that whom God, God has blessed us. We look after our kids, our grandkids. We've got the church in our will. We're, we're trying to do the right thing. In five or six years time, we may not be able to do that. We probably won't because we won't have the, 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 the income source. So for some of you who are wealthy, hey, come on, you can do it. Think about it. You can put in 5,000 a year. For those of you that are not so wealthy, hey, you might be able to put in, you know, 400, $500 a year. You know, some of the most significant gifts have been from our poorer people. I remember one of our senior ladies, Mrs. Gent, gone to be with the Lord. In one of our stewardship campaigns, she came and said, I want to put my funeral money in. We said, your funeral money? Yeah, I got $5,000. I want the funeral money to go in. I said, but Mrs. Gent, it's your funeral money. So we argued with her and we soon learnt you never win with her. So we thought, what do we do? So we took this part. We said, well, let's talk to her family. So we found some family members that were still alive. We said, look, she won't. And they said, just do it. She'll make life hell for us too if, if, if you don't. <laughs> so what we did was we said, you know what, Mrs. Gent, we'll receive it. But if you don't save enough for your funeral and, and the Lord takes you home, we will cover the, we'll cover the shortfall. So we put that in writing. We actually said, we will cover it. You just, you just want to be careful. She did it once. She actually saved another bunch and put an extra funeral money money in. <laughs> Amazing. So what a sacrifice she was. I still remember Mrs. Mrs. Baker, who's gone to be with the Lord. Well, probably 91. And she said, Bill, I want to be the first one to put in. I said, you do? And she's walking down. And she says, oh, she had a thousand bucks. Nothing. She had. It was like putting in a hundred thousand dollars first. She put it in. But we all wept. We said, Mrs. Mrs. Baker, are you sure? Yes, I want to do it. If I can do it, everyone else can do it. She was from England. She was tough and rough and like, I'm gentle compared to some of these golden oldies. They said, if I can do it, you guys can do it. Hey, it's not the amount, seriously. You pray. May the Holy Spirit lead you. If you can build an element of faith and sacrifice that it may cost you a little bit, then do it. If you do it because you're pressured to do it or out of guilt or fear, there's no blessing. But do it out of love, out of loyalty. You're part of the family. And on that day, the 23rd, let's all come together. Have the, it's all in here for you. And let's contribute. And wouldn't it be great if we can put, let's say, a third of what we commit into that one offering? And that would be great. At least we could knock off that $48,000 debt situation and start planning for, for the other things. So, so I'll give it to you and say, church... You've always been very, very good. This has been a wonderful experience to see people generously giving. And already we've had people responding. And um, 
and leading by example. And so uh, there's a stack of people that are already saying, yep, I'm in for this, I'm in for that. And uh, so, uh, so we're thrilled about that. Can we stand together? As you hold this in your hand, I, let me pray for you. Father, guide every person here. And also in our children's church, in our youth church, in all of our congregations. Lord, may, may this be seen as a vehicle by which blessing can come to extend the kingdom of Jesus, the effectiveness of what we do here as a church and also for our community groups that see this place as their home away from home. And Lord, I know that if we do it right, there will always be blessing that comes. We don't give to, be, to, to receive, we don't give to be blessed, but we know you can't help but smile upon your people who worship with all their hearts and who dedicate themselves to you. Help us, Lord, to apply this parable of the shrewd manager. Help us to be wise in how we handle finance. We pray it in Jesus' name. Let's sing a song as before Pastor Nathan comes.